Come on in if you can hear my voice in the back. If you are visiting with us, there are blue connection cards in front of you in the pews. You can fill those out. One side is a prayer request side, and uh, another is ways to connect with us if you haven't done that before. Uh, we would love for you to fill that out. Throw in the offering plate when you when that goes by later on. Uh, that's one way to do it. Or hold on to it and find find you later after service. Give to me. This. This Wednesday night, we have an Ash Wednesday service. Come, we run it a bit different than uh, Sunday morning here. So you're invited to that, anyone, everyone, 6.30 on Wednesday evening, Ash Wednesday service. Uh, starting up, there is our, today, actually, I'll first say this, there's the Lent devotionals that you wrote, Pastor Heather put together, and those have been, they're scattered all around the church, I believe they're in mailboxes too, there's extras laying around. Or purple things if that is familiar. Uh, so grab those that starts Wednesday if you don't know what to do with that. The first one corresponds with Wednesday. Uh, so Lenten season is upon us and one of the announcements you'll also read about in the bulletin is a Lenten Bible study that Pastor Heather and Susan Hockma are running and they're inviting you to. That starts on March 5, uh, 9 to 10 30 in the morning that's in the bulletin check that out if that's interesting to you also anyone can go to that that's not a certain gender or anything like that anyone can go uh, tomorrow night we have a leadership retreat we've talked about that for about a month now i'm done talking about it tomorrow night you're invited so what that looks like if you're wondering is elders deacons are there um, and then the invitation is for anyone else who's not an elder to be a part of that conversation and help add more to the fill-in gaps sort of thing, right? Just different perspectives, different um, angles on things, even if you're not in leadership right now, air quotes around that, um, you're really welcome to that team. So that's tomorrow night at 6.30. The little piece of info for that is we start in the youth room. If you didn't know we had a youth room, it's in the back part of the building, maybe you've never been over there, just cut through the gym, and there's a, a room that will have a door open. Community car here is here on Monday night, you'll notice a lot of other things going on. So you go to the youth room, that's where we'll start, and then we'll move into the gym after that when community recovery is done. So that's tomorrow night, 6.30. So we want to try to start at 6.30, so come earlier, not Calvary time. We're not starting at 7, 6.30. So show up on time if you're able to. And then uh, that's about all I have. Check out your bulletin for more information that I might have not said or you missed. That's when we do it. And I think I'm out of the way. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. This is the day the Lord has made. Okay, I had some different versions there, but all right. <laughs> it, was, it was good. I, I heard it. I heard it. Uh, if you are able, let's stand together and let's sing and worship our God.
this church, and I'm preaching this morning, and Pastor Mark is away with Marcia today, and I hear today is his birthday. Happy birthday. So happy birthday to Pastor Mark, who I don't know if he's watching online, but he will, and you have all week to wish him a happy birthday, so please do. You are here in God's house, and God greets you. Receive his greeting. Grace, peace, and kindness be yours today from God the Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now that God has greeted you, I invite you, and you don't have to use hand-to-hand -hand contact if you don't want to, uh, I invite you to pass that peace and kindness around the room by greeting each other. If you'd like to, you may remain standing. There's just one more song. I think we can do it. You know, that, uh, that song we just sang, uh, Crown Him With Many Crowns, uh, that last verse, uh, there's some words in there that we don't use every day. Uh, potentate, uh, creator of rolling spheres, ineffably sublime. Um, basically, what that verse was saying is that God is the king of kings and lord of lords and there and he is so awesome he is so great there aren't words to express that what an amazing god who is so far above us and so great and yet and yet he's a good good father who loves us and cares for us, us and cherishes us it's, a, it's an amazing god that we worship this morning <laughs> Oh, 
in their mind, in their soul. Lord, we pray for relief in our world for those who are suffering, including people who are starving, people who are oppressed by evil regimes, people who are suffering all kinds of affliction and torture, victims of trafficking and various areas of the world and life that have gone completely sideways. Lord, have mercy. And Lord, we pray for our participation in your world, that we would be part of the solution that you would work through us as agents of your grace in your world, however you see fit, that you would plant in us seeds in our hearts, move us, Lord, that we would be a light in your world, that we would be people of compassion. Lord, we pray that you lead us now as we Continue our worship and offer our gifts and hear your word and wait for you. Holy Spirit, move in this place. Move in our hearts. Move in our lives. In this moment, in this hour, and beyond. In this week, in our homes, in our relationships, in our lives. We need you. We need you, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Children, it is time for you to continue your worship in children's worship. If you are pre-K through first grade, you can head on back. And parents, you may pick up your children at the end of church. Go. And our offering this morning is for the ministries of Calvary Church. And if you'd like to designate some of your offering, each month we have a special offering, and this month it's for hand to hand. And the hand to hand offering goes to uh, providing food for children through lunches and backpacks. And if you'd like to do that, you may do that. May the Lord bless you as you give to him. And while the offering is being received, Alvin and I are going to sing a song of preparation in anticipation of the word of the Lord today. <coughs> you have my heart, and I will search for yours. Jesus, take my life and lead me on. Lord, you have my heart, and I will search for yours. Let me be to you the side. Search for yours. 
Jesus, take my life and lead me on. Lord, you have my heart, and I will search for yours. Let me be to you a sacrifice. And I About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. His clothes became bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companion were very sleepy, but when he, they became fully awake, they saw his glory, and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, is it good for us to be here? Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son, whom I've chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Benita. Appreciate that. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. I, I expected cheers. <laughs> Actually, um, some of you may be saying, what, is that a thing? Like, what, what's Transfiguration Sunday? Um, the last time I preached was Super Bowl Sunday and Groundhog's Day. And I actually received from multiple people suggestions that I preach on both of those things, which I didn't. Uh, and I've 
never, at least until this year when we studied the Transfiguration in Bible study, have I received a suggestion to tr preach on the Transfiguration. But Transfiguration Sunday always falls the Sunday before Ash Wednesday, which is just a few days away, the Sunday before the kickoff to Lent. So, let's find out why. About 10 years ago, I was sitting on my couch. It was a spring morning, Sunday morning. I was reading my Bible, drinking my coffee, the best part of the day. My daughter, Zoe, was about 12 years old at that time. She was sitting with me. We were on the couch, and, and the couch faced a bank of windows, which gave us a view to our backyard, when a brilliant flash of lightning struck in our backyard. I jumped. She screamed. I spilled my coffee, and the TV no longer worked. The lightning was so bright, it lit up the entire main floor of our house. Later, we learned that it took out the sprinkler system of the neighbors across the street. What was this peaceful, calm moment in our day? suddenly became confusing and chaotic, and it would be days before we found out the ramifications of that event, how it affected everything in our house and in the households around us. Well, in our scripture passage today, the disciples have gone away with Jesus, Peter, James, and John, up the mountain, to a quiet, peaceful place. They've, they've gone up the mountain away from the chaos and, 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 and the people and all of the activity that follows Jesus everywhere he goes to pray. And similarly, their time is disrupted by chaos and confusion and all kinds of activity. So as Benita explained to us before she read the scripture, Jesus had just explained to the disciples about his death. He's going to suffer many things. The passage right before our passage talks about he's going to be he's going to suffer many things. He is going to be crucified and then he's going to be raised from the dead. You know, as you know, totally straightforward that's going to happen. Well, the disciples don't understand that. So in the people that I've talked to who maybe didn't go, grow up in the church or just grew up in, uh, around the church and, or just in church a little bit here and there, may not know a lot about Jesus, but what they do know about Jesus is Easter. They know about the cross. They know about Christ dying on the cross, death, resurrection. That's an event that people, if they know something, they know about that. The disciples do not. We have the privilege of hindsight. So we read in scripture, he's going to suffer, he's going to die, he's going to raise for the dead. Yeah, that makes sense. The disciples don't have that experience. It's difficult to read scripture and understand from their perspective how foreign that sounds. How off the board that sounds. But Jesus says it's straightforward, straightforward language. This is going to happen. I'm going to be killed, and on the third day I'm going to raise, be raised from the dead. And they, they just can't process that. He tells them again, and he's going to tell them again, and you can read about it in all the Gospels, and they don't get it until much later, until after it happens. Even, I mean, they, even after it happens, they're confused, and they don't get it, and they're sad, and they don't understand why. I mean, it takes a long time for them to really understand what's going on. So he's just told them, this is going to happen, and if you want to be my disciple, which they totally do, they want to be followers of Jesus, they are all in, they've left everything to follow Jesus, they're, they're committed, these are committed guys, if you want to be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. Again, not super clear. 
But they're all in. They're going to do it. They're in it with Jesus. But just keep talking because we need more information. But we're just going to follow you. We're going to just keep trying. So he's explained this to them. And he's taken Peter, James, and John, his inner circle. And he's taken them up the mountain to pray. Now, this is a rhythm. If you follow the life of Jesus, if you read through the Gospels, you're going to see this is a rhythm. Jesus is constantly going off with his disciples or by himself to pray. He sneaks off early in the morning to pray. He goes off to a quiet place to pray. He is constantly praying. We don't get to see in Scripture what Jesus prays about. We don't get to read what his conversations with God are like. Is he um, lamenting the pain and the brokenness of the world? Is he getting instructions from God? Is this like a holy download? Is God telling him what his instructions for the next day are going to be? Is he receiving empowerment from the Lord? Is he just sitting in silence, just resting with God? Are they chatting? Is, what is it like for Jesus to be in conversation with God? We don't get, we're not privy to how that goes, but we know that Jesus does it regularly. And in doing that, and sometimes he brings his disciples with him. Sometimes they get in a boat and go away. Sometimes he, he, they go up a mountain. Sometimes they just, they, all varieties of ways throughout the Gospels. And he sets up, he sets an example for them. He does it, you do it, let's do it together, let's do it alone. This is this is a way of life. This is fundamentally necessary. In order to do what we do, we need to be in connection with our Heavenly Father. So, all kinds of activity and ministry, and fundamental to the kingdom, it's why he came, is going on. And then he takes Peter, James, and John up the mountain. He's like, go, let's, let's go camping. Let's take a time out. Let's go up the mountain for some time, and scripture tells us, why are they going up the mountain? To pray. They go up the mountain to pray, and then during the prayer, while they were praying, Jesus' face changed. More details would be great. We don't get them. Think maybe like Moses in the Ten Commandments when he comes down after being with God and it's changed. We don't know. That's Hollywood. Who knows? Jesus' face changed and his clothes become bright as a flash of lightning. So think of what I just described about the lightning that I wasn't even looking at in my house that illuminated the entire main floor of our living room. Jesus' clothes became brilliant, bright as a flash of lightning. Chris was telling me this week about um, lightning striking about 30 feet from him on a couple of different occasions. And it's like spots in your eyes bright where you can't see. Like, if some of you are nodding, you've seen lightning that close, yes. Like, that bright. So, what's going on? His face changing brilliant as, what's happening? We're, like, first we're praying with Jesus, if you're thinking from the disciples' perspective. Go up on a mountain and pray, not unusual at all, Jesus does this all the time, and now well, something's happening that has never happened before, this is not what typically happens when we go pray with Jesus. And then, very unusually, two dead prophets show up, Moses and Elijah. And what are they doing? They're chatting. They're chatting with Jesus about his departure that is soon going to come to pass in Jerusalem. They're having a conversation about it. Now, interesting, there's all kinds of nuances in the text that that just, you know, little tidbits that get us more information because there's, you just, we just get these few little words. But uh, departure, the word for departure is exodus in the Greek. And so exodus, what does exodus point to? Moses. Moses is there with him, right? And what did Moses do? Moses 
freed the people, God freed the people from slavery out of Egypt into the promised land. Well, now here's Jesus. He is going to free all of people out of slavery to sin and death once and for all, forever, into life. So we have this imagery, right? So they're talking about his departure. And then the natural response to this is what? Well, the disciples are sleepy. What? They're, they're sleepy? The disciples are sleepy? That's the very next line of the text. The disciples are sleepy. But then they wake up. They, they, get, they, they become awake. And then uh, Peter, the way Peter is, who is, uh, well, no, so sleepy. And then, and then they see God's glory, or Jesus' glory. So when they become fully awake, they see his glory. What is that like? To see his glory. God glorifies Jesus, and the disciples get to see it. And then Peter, being impulsive Peter, always got to do something, man of action. Let's, let's build shelters. Let's, let's, let's build tents or shelters and one for Elijah and, and, and Moses and Jesus. Let's do it. Let's take action. Let's do something. And, and as the text says, he didn't know what he was talking about. I mean, th this is just so confusing and outside of the realm of normal. We read scripture like it's just happened and here's the list of things that happened, but this is really unusual. And then the clouds roll in. The clouds roll in and they are afraid. Now what? As if everything so far isn't enough, now God of heaven and earth causes the clouds to roll in and they cannot see. And then a voice speaks clearly. And the voice is talking to the disciples. This is my son whom I have chosen, the voice says. Listen to him. What does all of this mean? They go to pray. Jesus' face changes. His clothes become brilliant as a flash of lightning. Dead prophets show up, chatting about Jesus' departure. The disciples become sleepy, and then they want to build shelters. And then they see the God's glory, or Jesus' glory. And then the cloud cover comes in, and then with clarity, a voice. The disciples are faithful followers of Jesus. They are in for the long haul. They do want to listen to Jesus, and they do want to understand. They do want to follow him, but they don't see him clearly. Literally, sleepy, groggy, foggy, chaotic activities. They are literally not seeing him clearly. And they are not seeing him clearly figuratively either. This is confusing. They don't understand. He's predicting strange things, and he's saying to do things that we don't know how to do. They don't see Jesus clearly. Well, like the disciples, we struggle to see Jesus clearly also. Some of us find Jesus confusing. <clears throat> Jesus, both man and God, Jesus going off to pray. If, if Jesus is 
God in body form, is he praying to himself? That doesn't make sense. Jesus is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one. Can you explain that? Well, sure, the Holy, the Trinity. Well, actually, no, not really. In fact, it's really confusing. Theologians who are experts in the field really can't explain that. So some of us just find Jesus flat out confusing. Some of us have a lopsided view of Jesus. We caricature him. When you caricature a person, you take one feature of them, and that becomes everything they are. So some of us like to caricature Jesus. Jesus is our friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. We like to think of Jesus as the person we want him to be, or who we like, what we like most about him, or um, who we think we need him to be. So we like the idea of Jesus being a friend because we find that comforting. He's our friend, he's our buddy, he's with us all the time. He is faithful and we can just hang on to him. He is our friend. True, but not a complete picture. Some of us like the social justice version of Jesus, the flipping over tables, taking down names, zero tolerance for sin and injustice. We like the social justice Jesus, and that's who we're going to imitate. Some of us like the Jesus is love. Some of us like the Jesus is the truth teller. We need more truth, and people need the truth. But when we caricature Jesus and just take one part of Jesus and, and focus on that one part, we don't get the fullness of who our Savior is. So that's not a clear view. And some of us intellectualize Jesus. We Acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary. Two natures, both man and God. He suffered on the cross. He died and was raised from the dead and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. All true facts about Jesus, but lacking the heart and the compassionate person that he is. So also not a clear picture. A full, clear picture. And the problem with not seeing Jesus clearly is that it means going, it means that we don't get to experience the full depth of a relationship with Jesus and not having a sure, not having sure footing, not having confidence in the one we put our hope in, or, or the one we may want to put our hope in, can be incredibly discouraging. It's difficult to navigate life when we can't see Jesus clearly. Just reading the headlines or watching the news any given day right now is overwhelming. The coronavirus is spreading exponentially daily. And now it's showing up in Iran and South Korea in places where nobody who had it before ever was. It's on the path to becoming a pandemic. What are we to do? The division in Washington, in politics, it, it seems as bad as it can be until the next day when the divisiveness seems even more ugly. And what's happening with our earth as fires and floods and storms just, what was that? Um, I'm missing it, I'm sorry, but I affirm it. 
Urbanet, you, you said something. <laughs> um, that that are that things are happening that are destroying communities and creation, and it, it's just so sad. People are suffering. The world is suffering, and then not even to mention all of the hate and the hate crimes and and the racism and sexism and homophobia and and it just goes on and on and on. And and maybe you don't even watch the news. Maybe you don't even want to turn on and you just like want to stay away from all of that. You don't even have to because the brokenness in your own life is enough. The uh, your children are struggling. Your family struggles. Your parents struggle. You struggle. One pressure, stress, failure, disappointment after another. What do we do? What do we do with all of this? Our text says today, a response in our text today says, Listen to Jesus. Go and retreat. Head up the mountain. God meets Jesus on the mountain in preparation for what's to come. If you remember back earlier in Luke, in Luke 3, God speaks to Jesus in preparation for his time of testing in the wilderness. Very similar to our text today, God speaks at Jesus' baptism and says, you are my son whom I love with you, I am well pleased. As a time of preparation, and then Jesus goes out. He pours into Jesus, and then Jesus goes out, and he endures 40 days of testing, and then following that, he launches into his three years of ministry. Very similar today, the transfiguration moment. God is speaking again in preparation, and then Elijah and Moses show up, in preparation for what Jesus is about to endure. Heading to Jerusalem, the cross. He is going to endure much harder than testing in the desert by Satan. And so here's another moment. It's why transfiguration, the, the transfiguration is such a big deal. He glorifies his son because he needs it for what's about to happen. And while God is doing this in the life of Christ, he speaks to the disciples in this moment. And God says to the disciples, Listen to Jesus. Follow Jesus. Pay attention. This is your path through the discouragement and through the confusion and the chaos and the brokenness and the darkness. Everything that you see now and are hearing and experiencing the locusts. This is your path, path through. And this is your path through what's to come. Follow Jesus. Follow him all the way to Jerusalem and beyond. Listen to Jesus. And God, and God speaks to you. He says, come, walk with Jesus. Find out who he is. There's a 19th century American literature classic written by a man who goes into the wilderness to listen and to learn and to gain wisdom. The book Walden chronicles Henry David Thoreau's two years and two months in a 10 by 15 one-room cabin on Walden Pond. He built it from recycled scrap wood. <coughs> outside of Concord, Massachusetts. And Thoreau wrote in his journal, our lives are frittered away by detail. We're busy, 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 busy. There's just, there's so much going on in our lives. 
This is like, what, 150 years old and totally can relate today. I, I imagine some of you studied, studied have studied, are studying, will study Thoreau. Our lives are frittered away by detail, Thoreau writes. Busy, busy, busy. Thoreau went into the woods because he wished to live deliberately. He writes in his journal, I wanted to live deep, to suck the marrow out of life, to live so sturdily, he said, as to put to rout, to eliminate, to get rid of all that was not life. To get rid of the clutter and the extra and to live pure and clean and true. The row went into the woods to eliminate clutter and he took time away from ordinary life to see more clearly. Jesus took his disciples up the mountain away from the crowds and the busyness so they could pray. And they saw his glory and they heard the voice of God. That could happen down at the base of the mountain with all the people. It's not that God can't do that. But it did not. While away from the busyness of life, God spoke. And the disciples heard his voice. And God is inviting you away. Away with him. To go up the mountain with Jesus. To be with him. To wait. To watch. To listen. Maybe your mountain, I mean, not all of us have access to mountains, to just get away to the mountain like they did. Maybe your mountain is your living room couch. Maybe if you're a person who hangs out at a coffee spot, your mountain is the prayer room or the corner meeting room or this sanctuary space. The mountain, for it, it, like I said before, is not the key. Sometimes he got in a boat with his disciples. The key is to get away, to get the clutter, get away from the noise. Maybe your mountain is in your car. God has something to say to you. He is inviting you to be still a minute so you can hear his voice. Maybe some of you are saying, well, that sounds really great, but I don't hear God's voice. He doesn't speak to me like that. Perhaps he does. You just haven't yet identified God's voice. God speaks in various and different ways. God speaks through the Holy Spirit. He speaks through words. He speaks through scripture. He speaks through music. He speaks through our thoughts. He speaks through creation. God is so creative. Not everyone hears from God in the same way. It takes time. It takes investment in the relationship. With certainty, though, with certainty, regardless of where you are on your journey with the Lord, regardless of what your past experiences are in relationship with him, with certainty, I can speak to each person in this room. God wants relationship with you. With certainty, that is true. He wants to be with you, and he wants you to know him. He wants you to see him clearly in his fullness, the fullness of who he is. Help 
healthy relationships take time. You know this. You're all in relationships. All different kinds of dynamic relationships. And you know if you neglect your relationships, if you don't put time into a relationship, the relationship suffers. Healthy relationships take time. And God is inviting you into a time-invested relationship with him. This Lent, you are invited on a journey with Jesus. Transfiguration Sunday, the Sunday before Lent, in the same way that Transfiguration is preparing Jesus for his journey to the cross, Transfiguration Sunday happens the Sunday before Lent as preparation for our journey through Lent to the other side when we celebrate resurrection. That's why it's where it is. You will find in your mail folders, and there's a whole bunch of them at the back of church, and as John mentioned, this book, some of you I can see you've already taken them up. It's Devotions for Lent. Phil, I, I'm just kidding. I'm giddy over this. Most of it is written by you, which is part of the big speed get so exciting. So many of you put stuff in there. I'm sure you're going to race home and just open it up. Look it up. Um, but the first several days are a collection of suggested spiritual disciplines. And they include Lexio Divina, a practice called Daily Examen, various methods of scripture reading, and various kinds of different ways to pray. Um, Lent and sacrifice, something people often do, give something up for Lent, is on the first page. And uh, journaling. So this, this contains various kinds of um, spiritual disciplines. I invite you to pick one. Pick one to commit to, to practice throughout the season of Lent and see what the Lord does with that. Right now, we're going to do a brief Lexio Divina on just two <coughs> verses. We'll practice it together, listening for God's voice. And I will lead us through that. I'll open with prayer, and then I'll move, move us forward. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you want relationship with us. We ask that you speak now as we open your word. First reading. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going, that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. invite you to speak out loud a word or phrase that stood out to you. Rest. 
third reading. Ask the Lord in prayer what he wants you to know or do or be as a result of this word today. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to them, Come away with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Fourth reading. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. church on the way home while you're having coffee to chat with the people around you. How you experienced that? Hearing scripture four times. Was that different for you? Awkward? Interesting? Did you hear words that you hadn't heard before? Did you feel the Lord speak to you? Talk about it amongst yourselves as you encounter the Lord. And as you journey through Lent, May the Lord take you on an exciting adventure. May you be surprised at his pursuit of you and your creativity. Thanks be to God. All right, praise team. I invite you to stand if you are able, and we will respond by singing... Let the praises ring. Thank you. 